Okay, I think more people will join us as we go through, but hello and welcome. I'm Anne Davis. I chair the London Mathematical Society Good Practice Scheme um, Committee, um, well, steering group, sorry. Um, we organize a couple of workshops a year on good practice, and we thought it was timely to organize something on promotions, particularly given the difficulties some of us have experienced with the pandemic and lockdown, extra caring responsibilities. So this is very much good practice in promotions. Um, our first speaker today is Nadia Mazza. Nadia is professor in mathematics at Lancaster University. And extraordinarily, she was promoted during COVID. So she's one of the people who knows directly how hard it is to both um, look at, you know, be a full-time academic with caring responsibilities and successfully apply for promotion. Um, before Nadia speaks, can I ask all of you who are not speaking to um, mute yourselves and then unmute when you speak, ask a question or something. Thank you. Um, so Nadia is going to talk about, um, let, let's talk about engagement. And it's over to you, Nadia. Thank you. If you'd like to screen share. Yeah, sorry. Is it in full screen on your side? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. So thank you, Anne, for the introduction. Uh, as Anne was saying, this, this workshop essentially also came out of discussions in, at a previous workshop in which uh, we discovered that practices between universities are very different. And um, it seems that some universities have not evolved for the last 20 years around um, promotion practices, which per se is a very bad practice because as we know, the, the life of academics has changed um, during these last 20 years. The diversity of academics has, has become uh, greater, has increased. Um, and so one of the key elements that I would say uh, from the last recent, from the recent years is this component about engagement. And I thought I should also do some homework about what is engagement, because I'm supposed also to support early career researchers getting promoted. Uh, and therefore, also I need to know what is engagement. So... Of course, I can only speak of what I know. So that will be engagement at my university, which is Lancaster University. It may be different at other universities. Now, if you go on the web and do some random search about promotion practices in, um, in academia, you may find some various blogs. And I found this one, which was uh, in the times of higher education. I think it was published in 2021 on the web. Um, by Adrian Furnham. And this is just one sentence, one punchline, which says promotion in academia has always been a rather opaque, opaque process that elicits deep emotions, mostly negative. And I would say that speaking with various people, it seems indeed to be the general feeling around, um, around promotion in, in academia. Um, now then, how universities respond to that varies greatly. And during this, um, this talk, I would like to go through some of the, the changes, the evolution that has occurred. Um, so what I've seen, especially at Lancaster, is that in, in the recent years, from the last 10 years, I would say onwards, there has been a greater increase of promotion based on balance case which is not only research led and supported by big grants, because we know that these are very scarce depending on your area. And they're also dif difficult to, to obtain. The, the success ratio may not be as big as we would like it to be. So some universities have, have responded to, this, um, to these changes by recognizing in some way um, the diverse contributions to the university that we make as an academic. Uh, for instance, 20 years ago, I don't know how many departments had an Athena S1. Um, I don't think there was many discussions around EDI in departments at universities. This has come up recently and is taking 
um, a greater proportion in promotion cases as well. So if you scan the, 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 university, uh, the university's website in the UK, uh, you see that engagement or whatever it's called, which is very really related, some sort of academic citizenship, public service, and I've seen other names, very mouthful, so I just didn't write them here. Uh, they have appeared in the, in the recent years. Uh, but actually, we, we are not the first one where we see this appearing. And I found an article which was published in the literature in Australia, dating back to 2014, where it was already a study about this component of engagement, or whatever it's called, in academia. And I will just let you read through this um, brief paragraph here. Yeah. At the bottom, you have the reference. You want to have a deeper look into this uh, the article. Um, and it, it is kind of an interesting read because we see that, well, first of all, United Kingdom seem not to be on the forefront of um, evolution or in, with respect to academic promotions, but they tend to, to follow some other universities perhaps where this has been working maybe better. However, wherever you, you look at, it still remains opaque. And uh, so I will try and discuss what it is at, uh, at Lancaster. So at Lancaster, there are essentially three, what they call pillars for promotions. There is the research one, the teaching one, as we would expect in a university. And now there is this engagement uh, pillar, which appears. And it can comport various things. We are going to see some examples later on. But this is the benchmark um, that if you want to apply for promotion for senior lecturer, on a balanced case, you will need to reach a score of two to two, whatever this mean, means, in each of these pillar. Instead for prof, it is three, three, two. So, well, a question that's, that sticks out here is, well, I can guess more or less what, what is a two or a three in research or in teaching. But what does it mean in engagement? Um, first of all, if you, if you read through the guidance, you will see that it's not enough to do your job well to, to meet that score. Uh, there must be a sustained evidence of success. I'm not sure that I understand what, how to judge that. Um, and you need to, meet, to show more. You need to show a component of leadership to show that you, you deserve a promotion to senior lecturer or to professor. Um, and of course, the guidelines, as always, there is this disclaimer at the end, the small prints, which says that even if you tick many boxes saying that you would score a two, it's not guaranteed that you will be scored at that level by the promotion panel uh, because they may not agree with your judgment. So there is this degree of... Um, this, this kind of gray area where there is no clear definition. We are mathematicians, so we like clear definitions and clear guidelines. In this area, there is none. So I would like to try and, and try understand what it means to score two in engagement. So the broad rules, they read very well. So if you read through promotion guidelines, you will see that there is a very nice text. You can guess that people who have written this are not pure mathematicians or statisticians. They just like nice language. And so they, they have a very nice vocabulary to say what, what it means. It is essentially the effective utilization of the university's collective intellectual and wider capabilities to serve economic and societal benefit. Engagement at Lancaster can be both internally and externally focused. And um, there are essentially five categories. There is a campus engagement, because in general, the campus life is part of the strategic priorities of university. There is the business engagement, because it brings money, as usual. This is one of the key components. Uh, there is the civic and cultural engagement. We know that now there is a lot of uh, discussions around the knowledge exchange and, and um, similar ideas, outreach. 
uh, which comes outreach comes in this public and community engagement and there is the policy engagement uh, which is something that well not everyone has the opportunity to contribute to that sort of engagement right so engagement it's often defined just by examples there is no this is definition the strict definition of what engagement means uh, research well we can guess what it means you just have outputs and you apply for grants and you organize your active in your community there is a, an international recognition but engagement so this is what um just diminish this so uh there are three bullet points here there are a few more examples there are I mean, I didn't copy all the examples because there were too many to put on the slides and to discuss in, in half an hour. But for instance, level two, you see that there is effective leadership. How do they judge that something is effective? I don't know. Uh, of a key aspect of an established strategic university partnership or project. We can create a new one, but we need also to demonstrate why there was this need of creating a new one and who are the stakeholders and how uh, are we set on a road for success, which is a bit vague. And well, there is still this, there is at level two, you see that um, there is also this appearance of EDI or Athena Swan. So significant and sustained contribution to a successful department, departmental or faculty. So here again, what does significant mean? Or what does sustained contribution? And I think that's one word when you work on the application. Sustained means maybe one or maximum two years to work on it. So is it what they call sustained? I don't know. Um, there are a few more bullet points. So there is also something that perhaps for mathematicians, it's pure mathematicians, it's very hard to do. Evidence of sustained integration of non-academic expertise into curricula. Well, I'm a beekeeper and a gardener. How can I, how will I use that when I teach algebra? There is no use in that. So I can just forget about it. There is effective mentoring and support of early career academics or academics from group underrepresented as um, senior levels within the university, right? So if you're um, no longer early career and you're a white male, you may have difficulties finding a mentor who wants to be promoted. Um, and there is also this successful and sustained minimum one year, at least there is a number here. We, we know that there is a kind of a measure. A performance in a departmental leadership role aligned to key departmental engagement priorities. For instance, schools, uh, student employability, we know that this is very important nowadays. Uh, promoting key research and teaching findings with a positive societal and economic impact. So again, this last one is kind of difficult depending on your research area. It's not always easy to, to share that with a public community, what you're what is your research about? Um, and there are others, right? But this is level two. So what does it mean now to reach level three, which is the higher up if you want to be promoted to professor in a balanced case? Well, again, it's all defined by examples. Now, if you, if you scan through level two and level three straight away, you can be a bit misled because if you read too fast, it seems that they're all the same. But actually, what they do is just substitute, take the same, similar as above, at level two, and substitute the word effective with successful or impactful. Right. So I just change this word. Um, how would I judge if I've been successful or impactful? I don't know. Um, but for instance, here we have successful and sustained performance, normally as a minimum of three years, as head of department, associate dean, deputy dean, or college principal. So again, some these rules are not something that you can just make up yourself. You need in some way 
to be elected. Uh, so it, it's tough, but it's also a recognition from the community that you are, um, that you are worth your, uh, your share. There is also evidence of impactful dissemination of strategies for integration of non-academic expertise into curriculum. Right, so uh, what is evidence in this case? How do you measure impact? And sorry, but again, my non-academic expertise, I cannot introduce it in the curricula in any way I want. Unless I would like, I may teach some other subject. Um, and then there is significant and sustained leadership of soci so social innovation and community engagement with demonstrable evidence of a successful impact and beneficial change. Right. So as you may notice, I'm not an English, I'm not native English. So when I read such a sentence, I first of all, I need to read it three times before starting to understand what it means. But even once I understand what it means, how can I prove that I'm that I obtain this, this kind of bullet points? I, I have no idea. Um, and then there is generation of external income. Okay, so this is something I understand. Uh, or investment to support engagement projects and partnerships. Right, so something needs to be assessed as, assessed as a engagement project or partnership. You must also find the stakeholders, which define that here's, here is the need for it, um, and how you're going to, to achieve the success in that area. Right, so, but there is this external income here, which actually is a clue to what they want. Um, and here, there is significant and sustained leadership of social innovation and community engagement with demonstrable evidence of its successful impact and beneficial change. Right. So the first thing that perhaps here I notice is that to see that there is a change that occurs, well, it means that there must be there must have been some time lapse. So it's not something that you can do from one year to the next. It's something that you need to plan at least three, four years in advance, if no longer. Uh, and here there is again this occurrence of Athena Swan, but here it is leadership of aspects of a successful faculty Athena Swan Award or overall responsibility and successful leadership of a successful departmental uh, Athena Swan Award. So here you see that the word uh, successful, significant, sustained, leadership, they all occur in the same sentence. Uh, and again, what does it mean overall responsibility? I mean, if you are managing uh, an Athena Swan action plan, you know that perhaps the EDI chair or the Athena Swan lead will just have an oversight of all the actions, but then the actions need to be delegated to the responsible people. So this aspect here is kind, I mean, this sentence here is a bit dodgy because overall resp responsibility is impossible if you're thinking, as the full responsibility of the Athena Swan. And, and then there is this blanket statement here. It says, any other engagement activity not already described, et cetera, et cetera. So how do we assess what engagement means? Well, I don't know. But something that, that needs to be said is that in the last 15 years, promotion practices at Lancaster have evolved, they've improved. I would say they've become more transparent. If I go back 15 years, there were staff left just because they could not get promoted. They were not getting the big grants they wanted. There were not enough money or not enough good publications as they, they were assessed. And so they just left as, to go elsewhere. Now, promotion practices have become more transparent, but there is still a long way to go. There are still many gray areas. And also there is no, they don't seem to be fair to all academics because no matter how you look at the promotion practices and the guidelines, it seems that academics are colleagues with flexible contracts, disabilities, caring responsibilities. They don't seem to be fully taken into account in the process they seem to be at a disadvantage. So for them, it, it would take longer to get promoted. Perhaps they're doing a great job, but their great job is not valued um, fairly in some, maybe in some sense. So now if you think of yourself and your university, 
because here I've been talking about Lancaster for, for the last um, 15 minutes or so. If you think of, of yourself in your, in your position, where do you want to, um, how do you want to progress? When do you want to progress? Well, there is a pathway to choose, balance case or research led, teaching led, it depends how it is. And the main point is, do you know where to find the information for it? and uh, the support that you may need for it. You may want always to have the support of your head of department. If you want to apply for promotion, there may be a promotion committee in your department. Uh, there may be, you may have some kind of line manager, or uh, we call them at Lancaster group leads. Um, and this is a person with whom you will discuss promotions. So you need to be open about it and look early where to find the information you need analyze these criteria, try to make sense of them, and think of a clear strategy how, to, how you can apply for promotion. And the main question is, wherever you are now, are you confident to apply for promotion? This is perhaps the last question for today. Um, and I see that I've been very fast. But I would like to take uh, to stop sharing now, and I will take some questions if there are any. Thank you, Nadia. Um, let's open it for questions, but I must say, I'm actually surprised that anyone gets promoted with such a sort of interesting list. And some of these things sort of strike me that you need to, to already be a full professor to actually do them, like head of department. Anyway, um, are there questions or comments to Nadia? Uh, Rachel, please go ahead. And I think that's uh, yeah. I'm just adding bits to my talk as as uh, <laughs> as I listen to you. But I think that point about having to plan quite a long way ahead is really important. And we're we're meant to have. We do have. We do have an annual review kind of process where we're we're looking at the things that you need to achieve to reach that promotion. Um, are meant to be discussed but I just don't think we do it effectively enough so I think the sort of mechanism is there but it's not always clear you you would like to think there are clear and transparent processes and you just tick the box if the box is ticked the box is ticked but as you said the the language can be very easily reinterpreted or misinterpreted so yeah I think I, I presume lots of other institutions have that um well, we don't call it a, we do call it a personal development thing, but it's also a sort of, um, how are you doing? What's, there's a, I can't remember any of the words, but yeah, a, a performance, review. performance, performance review, review, thank you. Review. So yeah. certainly when we write Athena Swan, we say it's a personal development program, but I think it's turned into a performance review too. But um, I'm not sure our leaders, local leaders are good enough at that stuff. So we have to think about how to support them to do that, I think. Um, uh, Rachel, um, uh, thank you. I'm not sure whether Sarah or I went first, but um, one of the things I think was really helpful you highlighted, Nadia, is the um, challenge that we sometimes face understanding the language of the, uh, of, you know, the, the documentation about priorities and and the documentation about uh, promotions. Um, I'm quite interested in terms of uh, the support that you were given, because obviously senior people, um, <clears throat> you know, deans and, and whatnot, may have more experience of, of seeing uh, promotion applications, uh, being on panels where, where promotions are reviewed. Um, did you get support from your institution and what was helpful um, in terms of, of providing you with feedback and, and trying to help you um, translate these HR type documents into things applicable to your work? So um, when I applied for promotion to a professor, uh, I was already senior, well, I was senior lecturer and as such, I was also group lead. So I was already line managing some people. 
And as such, I was complete. I was essentially, uh, my line manager was the head of department. So of course he had gone through a process several times and that was very helpful uh, because then I also got the, the full support from the department uh, and had been involved in Athena Swan. So this box, once you take it, you take it. Um, and when I applied, essentially that was not exactly the same criteria. So already they've changed since 2020. They've introduced this engagement component uh, because now the university has a new VC and there is, um, yeah, they, they are more engaged as a university, I think, with the businesses and industry. So I think that I've never been shy to ask for help. So even if the head of department was my line manager, I also went to other colleagues and said, this is my promotion case. Can you please give me feedback? And they did so. Yeah. Sarah? Uh, thank you, Anne, and thank you, Nadia. Uh, so to me, it's always uh, very interesting to see how many different practices are out there. And you started your, your uh, you know, contribution saying, uh, indeed, that uh, some institutions have moved on, others seem others seems to go backwards. Uh, so so that, that, that was, to me at least, um, refreshing to see that Lancaster does recognize additional activities, you know, and we might argue to what extent, whether they are, uh, you know, whether that is enough or I'm sure you know, that, that that could be improved. But um, the the variety of practices to me is the striking uh, uh, aspect. Um, so so I, I my question to you would be how how it is the pro process managed uh, so people do put themselves forward uh, or or there must be someone uh, at departmental level um, um, you know approaching them and and suggesting them so so how how does it work on the ground uh, whether whether it is a self nominating process or or more um, structured so in general, it's it's more structured. So uh, this was changed after the first Athena Swan application that we had uh, in 2016 uh, or so. And essentially, we also came up during that Athena Swan action plan, the first one we had, to create an action around promotions and progress in academia. So since then, we have established a promotion committee, which is uh, composed of all the line managers of the academics. So in a sense, it's it's hoped that the, the the group leads, as we call them, they will discuss during the performance development and review, annual review that we have um, with other colleagues, if they want, if they're, um, if they're yeah, with their staff, if they want to, to apply for promotion. And then perhaps not that year, if they're not ready, but the group lead will help that person, that colleague, getting on to possibly new responsibilities that will help the case. Uh, so there are discussions. Then once the group leads um, have discussed one-to-one, -one, there is a promotion committee, which meets uh, kind of October, so maybe a month before the promotion deadlines. And they bring to the promotion committee, this is, uh, this staff would like to apply for promotion. Uh, and in general, the group lead shows some support for uh, their colleague. And then promotion committees decide because it's headed, it's chaired by the head of department. Um, so yeah, I think there has been some structure in the in the recent six seven years. Yeah. Um, Jeff. Hi. Yeah. Um, that, that was a that was really interesting to see what uh, Lancaster is doing. Um, and I, I think I, echoing some of the things that uh, Sarah said, uh, I, I'm really pleased to see the effort here, the, the intention to, to recognize this diversity of contributions. And it, it seems like maybe the, the problem that you were focusing in on was the gap between the, the good intentions behind this and then the actual implementation where we end up with some vague statements that don't necessarily fit all disciplines equally well. And we end up with these problems of um, normalization and, um, and uh, setting expectations, you know, translating these generic descriptor words into concrete examples. Uh, but it, it seems to me like um, th this is maybe a little bit of an example of this general phenomenon that 
when you have established a, a collective understanding and a memory of, of the system and what's expected, then you, people are happy. And as soon as you rock the boat by changing the expectations, um, then people are unhappy, regardless of how good the intentions were. I mean, we see this all the time with our teaching, where you, you have an exam that's not very well designed pedagogically, but the students know that kind of exam. And then you change it to something that's pedagogically much better and the students are all unhappy. Yes, yes, there has been a revolution when they introduced this engagement component at Lancaster. Yeah. Because, huh, I've been, I don't know, they, they said, I've been director of studies for so many years and now it doesn't cost anything for promotion. <laughs> But actually, I think that, as you said, it's this good intention. It's just a start. So let us wait and see how that evolves because it's just a start. So hopefully yeah. they will keep improving. <laughs> yeah, but what, sorry, what I, what I was going to ask was uh, you, you said uh, promotion can be on the basis of a, a balanced case. Yeah. So, so is that, I, I didn't quite understand, is that that everybody is required to present a balanced case? Or, no, no, or that's no, no you can option. still be, still take the traditional roots, uh, research led okay. case, but of course, uh, that means it's the traditional roots, so it roots, so, so there is not much difference. So, so there's there's just a, another option open now, yeah. but this new option is unpleasantly vague. Yes, engagement is. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay, but then I, I mean, I think that some of that's maybe inevitable, don't you think? Because the engagement is such a, a broad swath of different things. You know, it it would be doomed to fail if we tried to be precise there. Yes, and this is why I was I was in some ways surprised to have to notice that this has already been going on in Australia eight years ago, eight, nine years ago. So there has already already been some literature published about it. So it may be interesting to to analyze there how that has worked and how to have evolved since, because in nine years, hopefully they will also have improved things and made things perhaps uh fair to all, if that makes sense, and clear, uh, clear process, clear bullet points. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, may, maybe, may, maybe what's needed is not making the criteria clearer, but just expanding the catalog of examples. Maybe definitions by examples, examples. So I didn't pick all the examples that were there, but it's all a long list of bullet points, which are in the same style yeah, yeah. I, it seems like uh, maybe what, what's needed is just more training data so people can think oh what i'm doing is similar to this thing which falls here on this list of examples yeah so i think that as uh, some of these uh indirectly i've contributed to some of these criteria uh, because i applied i said with a previous criteria which didn't count engagement there was something kind of uh, academic leadership or something like that um and there also, there was a clear component that actually had engaged a lot in outreach. I had engaged with Asina Swan. And that seems that to have kind of influenced in some way, some of the criteria. Um, and I was not the only one. So they, they may have noticed that it is time to change something. Thank you. A final question from Alex. Thank you, Adia. That was great. So at our institution at Sheffield, we've had a similar framework in place, I think for about three years now. And actually all teaching and research staff have to go under what you would call this blended pace. So we have four pillars and you have to have a certain number of boxes ticked under each. But I think the feeling amongst many staff is that all this has done is made it harder for everyone. So we've gone from a case where you go only got promoted if you got a big research grant, to a case where now you need to get a big research grant and you need to be showing you get good student feedback on your teaching, that you're doing innovative teaching practices and that you're involved in academic citizenship under our labeling. Um, have you, given that you've got both routes open, do you have any feel for whether it is harder under the blended approach at Lancaster or, or have they tried hard to level it? Well, it depends on your contribution to the university. If you, some people, some, some colleagues may not have as much time for research as, especially during since the pandemic, our research time has just collapsed. Uh, we have lost many staff. We have not been able to hire. So our contribution to the universities has not been so much on research because we had no time to do research, no time to write grants. Um, and we were essentially doing a lot of teaching. 
and doing a lot of outreach. Uh, there were other things that the department had to, to maintain with the businesses. We have a big stats section, so they were engaged with the businesses industry. And so I think that it, it's not harder, it just opened a new pathway by which, depending on the type of the job, academic job that you have, you can still progress, even if you are not on the traditional route of research land or teaching land. So Great, sounds like we've got a lot to learn from you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much for that excellent presentation, Nadia. And you know, we, we all have different criteria in our universities, but thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you very much. Welcome. Um, yeah, in, 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 in the lecture room, we would all be clapping. But um, so, um, we move on to our next speaker, which is Helen Wilson. Helen is head of maths at UCL. Her title is promoting good practice, the role of the department. And Helen should know this very well because that's precisely what she's been doing at UCL over all these years. So over to you, Helen. Thank you very much, Anne. So I'm gonna, um, no, apparently I'm not gonna share my screen. I'll just go and relaunch the presentation and then share screen again in the hope that Zoom can find it this time. Let's try share screen. Okay, I'm just going to have to share my whole screen, I think. So, oh no, there it is. Got it. Sorry. (laughs) Right. Can you see? my slides. Good, right. Now, I don't have a whole lot in my slides. Um, It's intending to just kind of muse on what we do at UCL and what bits of that might be a good idea and might not. Um, So I've got four years, four and a half years of experience of as head of department of going through the promotions process sort of from the top. Plus, of course, all my own experience of going through it from the bottom. Um, And I think I've seen a variety of things that do and don't work. So that's really what I wanted to talk about. So I'm going to start by talking about how we do it at UCL. And there's a different process at three different levels. So I'll do those all separately. And then I just want to pull out what I think is good and what I think is a potential weakness. And I've got even more notes written down that are not on the slides, just from having the same thoughts again while Nadia was speaking. So let me start with... Uh, grade seven to eight. So grade seven may be an associate lecturer on the teaching pathway, or it could be a research fellow, or it could be a lecturer A. Now we don't hire lecturer A's anymore, but I know that other institutions do. So that's still the grade seven to grade eight transition. Um, So for us, we do sometimes hire associate lecturers brackets teaching, And under the teaching concordat, which we signed about two or three years ago, whenever we hire one of those, we have to put in place a clear pathway for how they will be able to achieve grade eight. And it's not just teach a course and do it well. There there has to be some element of departmental leadership, but it doesn't have to be big. So they they just need to take charge of a thing and run it well. When the Teaching Concordat happened, I had the opportunity to look at all our grade seven staff and unilaterally regrade any to eight with like two sentences of justification from me on how they deserve this. And I did that to everybody, except we've got a bunch of people who come in on like a sixth of an FTE to teach one module who are largely retired staff who just want to teach a thing. Um, And they have no desire to progress and they're not doing anything outside of their module so they can't progress. Uh, And we also had two people who were fresh out of PhD that year and who just needed more experience. So in both those cases, I gave them a clear pathway for what they needed to do. And then I promoted them a year later. The process, so there are also a lot of research fellows who um, they start on grade seven typically all our postdocs start 
near the bottom of grade seven. But if they stay here for a long time, they can eventually get to the point where they're looking at being promoted to an eight. So that is the same process, uh, but kind of less directly under my jurisdiction because they will, if as postdocs, they'll all have their own PI. So the process is completely open. You can apply at any time, but whenever the a promotion is successful, the change of status and critically the change of pay doesn't kick in until the following October. So there's no point in doing one now. I always do it in the summer when especially the teaching people are not teaching and so they have time to fill in the forms as well. Um, it's very, very light touch. So there has to be a CV and a justification. There, there are published criteria. They are a bit woolly, like the ones that Nadia was describing, because they are designed to fit an entire institution with all of its different disciplines. So they are interpretable, I would say. And at this level, especially living in London, I'm usually trying to get everybody over the bar as quickly as possible. So I think slightly vague and interpretable guidelines are helpful because I can say, yes, this person's doing this and this and this. And I judge that for this discipline, that's the appropriate way to do that. And basically, it's so light touch that nobody checks it. I have to write a paragraph saying how they hit the criteria. And as far as I can tell, nobody ever reads that paragraph. So um, it works really well because I'm paying attention. <laughs> but it could easily not work well because there is nothing from on high saying I need to do this and when. But right now, we don't have any lecturers teaching who are on grade seven, who are on more than a year long contract. And if you're on a year long contract, you can't get promoted. There isn't time. Um, and yeah, we have a staffing officer who pays attention to the research fellows and how long they've been in post and kind of nudges the line managers when it's time to consider the regrade. Re so that's kind of a small thing. Most people are not on that transition. The main one is promotion to grade nine or 10. So eight to nine is the lecturer to senior lecturer or reader, and we've eliminated the distinction between the two. So it's now to associate professor. And then grade 10 is the progression from senior lecturer or reader, because we have plenty of them left over, or associate professor to professor. And that's much more formal. So there is an annual senior promotions round. Everybody is emailed out by Central College telling them that it is opening. And there is a regimented process. So there is a departmental promotions committee, which is supposed to consider all staff who are currently grade eight or nine. The light's gone out, never mind. Um, and look at them relative to the academic framework, which is a document full of these very woolly criteria, such as Nadia was describing, and assess where they are and how close they are. So we announce it to the department and staff submit their CVs if they think they might be ready. But one thing that I that, that we do and that I think everybody is supposed to do, but I am getting anecdotal evidence that not all departments do, is we go through the entire list. And if there are people who have not submitted CVs, but who are looking reasonably close, or even where we just go, I don't know how close that person is, we will request a CV from them and then discuss it around the committee and see whether we think that they are ready. So that's the process at that level. And then professorial pay. We have four bands um, and the criteria are published. Now, when I say published, they're not public published. You can't see them if you're outside UCL, they're behind the paywall, but all members of the UCL community can see what they are. Um, and it is very much as Nadia was describing that there are there's a sorted criteria and you have to hit at least two of this category and at least one of this category and at least one of these two other categories. It is an, an individual application and we don't have any oversight by a committee on this one. So the invitation goes out to all professors and then nobody interferes with that professor while they make their own decision as to whether to apply for rebanding. They just apply and then the forms come to me as head of department and I have to write a, a statement 
explaining how I think they do meet the banding criteria or whether I think they don't meet the banding criteria and, and how they've missed. So that's like the big steps. So we have four bands. A newly promoted professor is always band one. Um, in this department, we currently don't have anybody at band four. So that one's more or less out of reach. I think if you get FRS, you probably get, get, get band four, but they're rare. We don't really interface with band four at all. And then the twos and threes are people who have done something really quite good um, and capitalized on it at the right moment. So things like being head of department for a length of time is basically, if you do a decent job, worth a rebound. Um, large amounts of grant income can be worth a rebound. And it's not like that. I mean, that's the reality that you need one of those big things to kind of hang your case on. But actually, there are formal criteria and you, you're supposed to be doing excellent things in education and in research and in institutional citizenship. Um, so that's the rebanding process, and that is formal and done by a central university committee, and there are clear criteria. And then there are two much less transparent processes. One is the inflationary increase, which applies to all professors except anybody who gets C rated at their appraisal. And the process is so whatever the opaque, that's the word, the opposite of transparent, so opaque that I don't even know how to send in a rating for a professor. So nobody under my watch has ever been C-rated. I mean, I, I'm not sure if there's anybody I would have wanted to C-rate, but because I don't know how, it's not even arisen. So everybody gets the inflationary increase and the amount of the inflationary increase obviously comes about through national negotiations and all the rest of it. That's That's nothing to do with departmental level. And then there's also the possibility of an increment. So on all the lower grades, you automatically get increments until you hit the top of the scale. There's none of that for professors. Each year, I am allowed to nominate roughly up to, I think it's 20% of my professors or something like that for an increment. And I'm guided each year by the Dean on how many I'm allowed to nominate in that year. And it does depend on the faculty finances, unlike all the other promotions, which don't. Um, so th those increments depend on the professor being A rated at their appraisal. And again, as I say, I have no way of stor storing or reporting these ratings, so I don't know where they come from. But the process is very much at the whim of the, of the HOD. So, I nominate whichever people I want to nominate, and I give justifications based on what they've done since the last appraisal. So what they've done in the last year, this is not a sustained contribution thing. This is a who did really well this year and deserves an increment. And that bit, I would say, is horrendously at the whim of the biases of the head of department. There would be nothing to stop me entirely nominating the people I like rather than the people who have done good things for the department. I mean, I have to justify it, but typically when you look at your professoriate, there will only be three or four people there who you couldn't justify an increment for if you tried really hard. So that's our process. And I can see that like Nadia, I'm also going to go very fast because I've only had 10 minutes so far and I've only got a little bit left to say. But what do I think has worked? What is good? So for a start, this regular annual process with a deadline on it, I think that is absolutely crucial. I've worked somewhere where there wasn't a deadline and I have seen colleagues who are more senior in age than me, who have led me when I was a new academic and who have achieved incredible things outside of their institution still not be professor just because there isn't an annual process to kick them into doing the forms on time. If it's a job you can postpone for a couple of weeks, you postpone it. If it's a job you have to postpone for a year, you probably get on and do it. So I think an annual process with a deadline is a really, really good piece of best practice. It's definitely best practice that we consider everyone. I have several examples of people who would not have applied for promotion until 
somebody from the promotions committee came to them and went, we've looked at your CV and we think you should apply for this promotion this year. And I'm one of those people, but I've certainly done it to lots of other people since then. Uh, the existence of a promotion committee, so it's a bunch of people who make who have these conversations, is great for just meaning that the chances that there's somebody in the room who can spot unconscious bias when it waves itself and call it out is much higher because you've just got more people in the room. And our promotion committee contains all the line managers, like the Lancaster one. So that's probably standard, I'm guessing, and seems like a really good idea. And then I think having published criteria, however woolly, is definitely best practice. It means that you can go to the framework and go, yeah, I think I might fit this lot. I think I might fit this lot. Oh, I don't, I don't quite, I'm not firing on institutional citizenship. I should ask for an admin job. They should be knocking my door down, right? Asking to do these jobs. So we don't have a category of engagement. And actually, I think that's a good thing because what we do have is categories that I understand. So research and teaching, we, again, we all understand what they are. Our teaching does have a bit of a tendency towards, it's not actually just about education, it's also about research in education and um, pedagogical literature and that which can be a bit of a struggle for mathematicians in particular, who are not very good at reading qualitative research. Um, but then we have two more streams, one which is enterprise and external engagement, which covers public engagement, i.e. outreach, knowledge exchange and enterprise. So that's engagement with business, engagement with policy, engagement with going into schools and trying to increase EDI, all that kind of stuff. All of that comes under that. And then we have institutional citizenship. So that would absolutely cover the example Nadia said, where somebody had been departmental tutor for however many years, and that didn't seem to be counting for anything. That sort of role absolutely counts in institutional citizenship. For the promotions at great, I think, in fact, at all promotion levels, the last two are optional. You have to hit one of them, but you don't have to hit both of them. And very often, mathematicians, especially pure mathematicians, don't hit the third one. But that's fine because they can do a perfectly good job on the fourth one like everybody else can. So that, that's what I think our strengths are. The potential weaknesses. It, the head's involved all the way. If you've got a head who is actively biased, there's no way you're getting around that, I don't think. But I would struggle to design a system that didn't have that weakness. It also depends on the efficiency of the head, um, especially in December, I have noticed. <laughs> and I'm, I'm in the process of changing our system so that actually the head references in December, for each person applying for promotion, the head nominates the requisite number of external referees and writes their own reference. And those two things have come with the same deadline. And I suddenly realized this year after four years of this pain, and when I was dealing with my mother with a broken hip in December, that there is no earthly reason for those deadlines to be the same. They need the referees' names out of us urgently so they can contact them. They only need the reference out of us at the same time as they need the references out of all those other people. So I think for my successor, we, we may have broken <laughs> that particular mm. bottleneck. But nonetheless, all of this, especially the grade seven to eight, depends on the head noticing that either, either the staff member themselves noticing that they might be up for this promotion or the head noticing it. There's no kind of systematic, oh, you're a grade seven and you've been there for more than a year. Do you think that has to be done locally? Um, the promotions committee is difficult to build well, I would say. You need all the line managers in it, otherwise you haven't got enough information. But unless you structure your line manager tree extremely carefully, that leaves you with a promotions committee that is too big to have a sensible conversation. Um, I designed my line management tree to make this work, and I've ended up with people line managing cross-discipline in a way that is clearly not working. So I fixed this problem, but at the expense of things that were worse. The research aspect of it is still dependent on external references. 
I don't think this is avoidable, but it is a place where you really can't know whether you are ready for promotion because that's the bit you can't test. And so you have to take the plunge and go for it when you're not sure. Because nobody can tell you what your reputation in your field is, except those external referees that you're going to ask. And in this system and all systems, you can't promote someone who doesn't apply for it. Now, I think the annual process helps with this because it gives you that kick of there is a deadline. I have one colleague who has a very heavy teaching load in the autumn um, and who we advised to apply for promotion uh, a year and a bit ago. And he simply said, I just can't. There is no way I can have the bandwidth to fill in these forms. And UCL makes life more difficult by making you put the CV in their perfect template that's in Word. So as mathematicians, we all have our CVs in LaTeX, right? You have to haul it out and put it into their own Word document and format it all into all of these weirdy sections. It is quite helpful for those reading it later, but it is very painful for the person doing it. With that colleague, I then had the conversation going, OK, you can't do it now. When's your empty bit? Oh, it's the first half of the summer. In the first half of the summer, please write your promotion case and we'll put it in the following year. And that's what we've done. And it's now in and under consideration. So you can get round that weakness, but it is nonetheless a weakness. And then I think I just have a couple more things to say that are really based on a response to what Nadia was talking about, rather than specific to what I've got, which is that if you see things like Athena Swan in the criteria, even if it's woolly, or mentoring people from underrepresented backgrounds, all of that, that is a real positive because it means that there is an actual promotion benefit to the people who do that stuff. And it means it's more likely to get done, but it also means that the people who lose out on research time and all of those other benefits by spending their time on this really valuable work get compensated in a real financial way for the fact that they have chosen to spend their time doing things that make the community better rather than just focusing on their own research. And I think that those grey um, criteria can be treated as an asset. And I know there is this awkward statistic that I, I don't know where it came from, but I, I'm assuming it's reliable that an average man will apply when he meets 50% of the criteria and an average woman will apply when she meets 80% of the criteria. And if the criteria are woolly, that makes it harder to be certain that you've hit 80%. 80%. Um, but when you're writing your promotion case, something where it goes, are you impactful? Well, you can choose the metric, right? You can go back and look at what happened and, and go, well, my student evaluations improved or my exam results came closer to the departmental norm or the NSS improved the year that we brought in this change, which I led. And you can choose what it is that you're measured on and you don't even have to do that in advance. So you can cheat. You can choose the measure that has improved, not the one that got worse at the same moment. I think that is everything I wanted to say except I have not mentioned one piece of what I think has the potential to be really good practice, which is that we now have this teaching pathway, which I know a lot of other institutions have. We have the potential for a move between the teaching and academic pathways. And you can't move sideways. You can only move diagonally. So at a promotion point, you can be promoted from lecturer to associate professor brackets teaching or from lecturer brackets teaching to associate professor if you meet the enhanced education criteria on the one side or the research criteria on the other side. It's quite difficult to do the latter because you're only allowed to spend 10% of your time doing research if you're on the teaching pathway. But if you can excel in research on 10%, then I think you really do deserve to get moved onto the academic pathway and to have the opportunity to really, you know, just imagine what they would do if you gave them the normal amount of research time. <laughs> so that I think is everything I wanted to say. 
I'm happy to open to questions. Thank you so much for that, Helen. That's amazing. Um, I must say I'm rather um, disturbed by so much relying on the um, head of department. In your case, obviously it's fantastic, but I know we were rewriting our promotions criteria a few years ago, uh, a little um, small committee at the university, and it was chaired by someone who was head of a, a large department. And he was inserting that the head of department has to approve this, the head of department has to approve that. And I was crossing that out and putting senior professor. And eventually- So actually, I, I, I should perhaps cl clarify some of that. So our promotions committee meets and we say whether the department will recommend. And if the department recommends, then I have to write a reporting statement, a supporting statement. But there is an alternative route where if the department does not recommend, the member of staff can apply for promotion anyway, bypassing the head of department. Now, that's not happened on my watch, which is why I forgot about it. But if there's a head of department who's being deliberately or accidentally awkward to some sectors, I can imagine that that's a good workaround. I think, I think it's absolutely essential because, I, you know, there's so many cases where people have problems with their head of department. I mean, you know, anyway, let's open to normal questions. I think it's um, Rachel, oh, yeah, Rachel Norman first. Well, I was going to say we've got that process, so it's not my intention to come here and be mean about my university, but um, I might. The, the problem is you still have to write, you still get the faculty in our case report. So if the faculty report says, I don't support this person because that person has whatever issues with the head of department or the dean of faculty, that still goes to the university committee. It's still at the front of the pile when they read it. And so they can they can bypass the faculty, but they but they still get the report that says specifically in this case, uh, this woman doesn't seem to uh, that leadership probably isn't all her own. She probably has someone helping her, you know, in that sort of. <laughs> a horrific fashion so I think it's great oh. that that route's there but it yeah. has to act independently and once you still ask the head of department why they didn't support it you blur the lines of but, um, yeah I it's awkward you have to rely on the, that committee to be able to judge the quality of the head's response at that point because what do you do when you've got somebody who is I don't know, on the borders of sexual harassment. And that's why the department isn't prepared to put them forward. And it's not quite formal enough that you can get it to disciplinary yet. But the head wants to say that. We don't want to take the department completely out of the process. Or somebody's just a lazy ass who won't do any of the admin. I think Nadia. Yeah, I just have a quick comment or maybe suggestion is that in our department, the previous head of department also, instead of writing all the supporting statements, he has the line managers to draft them. And so that then- So we need, we need an internal reference as well as the head. So they typically do that one. So yeah. they're already busy. <laughs> they can improvise. Both. That is perhaps too many, actually. It's not clear why, why those two are both needed. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, another Rachel. Thank you. Um, I really liked you highlighting that sort of uh, committee positively encouraging people to consider promotion. Um, and I, I think particularly on the sort of gender front, that, that aspect is absolutely crucial um, to have that encouragement. I certainly, you know, positively experienced that myself and were privileged to be able to do that in, in my department recently. But I, one thing you didn't mention, and I'm interested in your view, is the flip side. You know, how do you deal with with perhaps those who, you know, feel they've been very unfairly treated and they're brilliant despite all the criteria? And why on earth aren't you promoting, you know, encouraging them their promotion, be that at the, you know, senior lecturer level or uh, so assistant professor level? or that professorial rebanding? How do you how do you manage that side of sort of over, over yeah. 
So actually at professorial rebounding, it almost doesn't apply because the system is set up so that they apply and then the final decision is taken at a much higher level. So that conversation never happens at departmental level. I can put in my input into the system and they never see it. Um, the intermediate level, it's actually the existence of a committee is very helpful because you're going to somebody and saying, the committee feels that you're not quite ready yet because of this bit of the criteria. And we make sure that we're always very clear on what they need to do to improve things. Um, and sometimes if somebody's getting really upset by it and we feel that the only thing that's missing is their external reputation, that they are really, really trying very hard at everything that they have control over, sometimes we'll just encourage them to give it a go because it might come off, in which case that's fine if you've got a colleague who's, you know, pulling the right way. And if it doesn't, the bitterness is not felt at the department. And so they become happier in their local working life, which I think is a positive for everybody. But I would only do that with somebody who I feel is really putting all the right effort in. You know, someone whose teaching is working well and who is picking up their institutional citizen and who is just generally being helpful about the place. But, you know, may not have got a grant in because it's such a lottery, you know. There are things outside their control that aren't quite necessarily firing. Sarah again. <laughs> Helen, I'm, I'm curious to hear what do you think of um, some institution discussing to get rid of external references? So when, when I left Loughborough when this was... Uh, very much in the discussion. They are reviewing their, their promotion criteria. They need to do that uh, for, for many reasons. But one thing that I took from your uh, um, presentation was that, um, you know, those are really positive. Uh, the, the last example could be, you know, a situation where you have someone uh, that does really pull their weights at departmental level and with that external validation, they could uh, perhaps have a, have a stronger case, etc. So, so to me, that is still a very important aspect. Uh, but again, there are there, there are discussion, and so I'm I'm curious to hear what would you make of it. I've never thought about it because I didn't know that anywhere was considering getting rid of external references. But on the fly, I think it's. It would be lovely to be able to get rid of external references and ensure that you are not dealing with anybody with rampant unconscious or indeed conscious bias. But mathematics and especially pure mathematics seems to me to get so specialized in its sub-disciplines that you just may not be in a position to judge. There's certainly plenty of my colleagues who I can't tell whether their research is any good. And some of their colleagues will give me their view, but if you're only ever to hire people who can be judged by people within your department, you're never going to grow in terms of the discipline, are you? So I think there has to be some sort of external process there. Th thank you. I, I also find this, uh, you know, an interesting debate, but yeah, thanks a lot. Um, Camilla. Yeah, I'm just wondering... I think neither of you really covered that part in, in our institution after the sort of whole process within the department, then there, there's an interview as well. Oh, we don't have an interview. That's why I didn't cover yeah, it. Yeah, I was sort of wondering whether, which I think is quite um, quite time consuming for everyone. <laughs> um, yeah. Is that something that happens in, um, no, no interview. Okay. Anybody else on the panel have interviewed? <laughs> Uh, yes, it asks in their interviews for reader and professor. Not for senior no. lecturer, though. Not for senior lecturer. Oh. Okay. So it's not, not that it's uniquely in within the, the whole UK that everyone needs to be interviewed by, by a sort of faculty panel. That <laughs> no, the that. first mm. interview I got was when I went for head of department. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> and, and, and I believe at Aston the the professorial interviews are at university level, not at faculty or college mm -hmm. level. Okay. I think we we have this added stage, which um, I sort of understand what it's supposed to contribute, but at the same time, it is quite labour intensive, I think, and mm -hmm. perhaps not. I was wondering if that necessary necessary. <laughs> 
at that stage. Yeah, well, I think we're showing it is possible to live without it. <laughs> um, Alistair? And thanks. Uh, firstly, Helen, I want to say thanks. I will implement your good practice in on the University of Bath. We don't have an annual uh, look at everyone in the department below professor. We should do. Uh, it's, it's, I, be, I was, I'm no longer on the promotions committee, but I was for about six years. And I think twice we looked through everyone, but it was a random, poor, ill-considered, you know, Google search. And I love the fact that you say, right, let's actually use this. Okay, we also have Word documents, but get people to uh, embrace the template, put their information down. And so then <laughs> the proportion- To be honest, times... at that point, I get people to send in their CV in whatever format it already is. So right. I don't waste their time if they're Okay, good point. So even though at some point in the future, they might have to do that if they're with you, they might then go elsewhere uh, yeah. or they might wish to be promoted, uh, you know, to apply elsewhere and perhaps not engage with the process locally. But also if they're just, if they, if they send us a CV and we're going, oh, yeah, no, not until you've got at least a couple more publications and applied for a grant, that's that you don't need it to be in the right format to see that. Right. But I like it. I, I, I really I just want to say thanks. We'll, we'll, we'll get you. negative feedback. It's really nice to hear. Good, it's good to say I appreciate it. Thanks. Okay. I think we're scheduled now. I mean, thank you again, Helen. That was amazing. Uh, one thing I should say is that for the um, professorial um, increments, um, you, whilst everyone has to apply or be invited to apply, we had a system here where the head of school or somebody in the central administration would sometimes chase people and remind them that they hadn't actually applied for a pay rise. Um, I only know that because I've been chased twice, <laughs> both successfully, <laughs> but I don't know if that's standard practice or not. Okay, so our final presentation is our Rachel Norman from Sterling, Professor at Sterling. Sterling. Um, this is on narrative CVs and what good promotion criteria should look like. Um, if you would like to share screen, Rachel. And on mute, all good, excellent. <laughs> right, thanks everyone. Thanks for inviting me to come and speak. I, uh, having followed the other two, I thought I was going to be quite controversial and outspoken, but it turns out we're all on the same page. So that's all good. Um, but I hopefully have something a bit. So I'm going to completely agree with everything that's been said already, but we'll add something. I was a bit worried. I was just going to say the same things over and over again at one point. Um, let me hang on, work out there how to change slides. There we go. So what I'm going to do is talk about why I think this is important, which I think sort of Nadia took as read, but I'm going to be explicit about. But that comes a bit from my background, then a little bit of time talking about narrative CVs. I don't know how much experience or knowledge you have about them. I'm going to assume you don't know much. But um, and then give you actually interestingly to tie in everything we've got, got three sort of institutions, promotion criteria, um, which have different levels of detail in. So it brings back all the stuff we've been been talking about in terms of what what we should be taking into account. So my background is that I um, did my degree in maths in Liverpool and then I've got a PhD in mathematical biology from the same place um, and came to Stirling in 1996 and um, we'll say that quickly. And I suppose part of the thing I try to emphasize all the time is that I was half time between 2001 and 2013. So promotion criteria I have to take some of that stuff into account for me. Um, Weirdly, I applied for a chair in food security and sustainability because they wanted a mathematical modeler in 2013. So that's how I got my back to full time and my promotion. I'm not convinced I would be promoted under our current internal promotion procedures um, for reasons I'll explain in a minute. Um, but four years ago, I'm institutional dean for research engagement and performance. So that's thinking about research culture. So that's 40% of my time. And then 60% is in the maths department doing the teaching and research and the same as everyone else. So it's from this sort of dean uh, institutional viewpoint that I wanted to talk about this. So, so one of the, I had a long list of things I needed to do as dean, but the main thing was um, support a healthy research culture. So, um, 
this is the definition I usually use for this, but it's about the values, behaviours, expectations, etc. of the research community, um, looking at career paths and how we conduct and communicate the research. And as we've all established earlier on, the funding environment's competitive and traditionally the definition of success is very narrow. So from my point of view, what I'd really like to see the inst our institution do, and I think we have we are working towards this is to provide this collaborative supportive environment we need to move away from the competitive environment that academia is full of um supporting staff to achieve their potential but looking at broad definitions of uh, success in research but actually across the piece as we've talked about the sort of balanced um thing and i put this in just because um, 2020 UKRI had a research integrity landscape survey and the things that had a positive impact on integrity and research culture were interdisciplinary research was one of those, um, as well as research leadership. And the things that were negatively impacted on um, incentives for good research integrity were how researchers were assessed for promotion. So this kind of you have to push to get your own achievements recognized um if you want to get promoted that sort of traditional model which i know we've been talking about avoiding but but that's that's why i think it's important we change this stuff and um, from my point of view the research culture piece is about getting the integrity and ethics right good role models and clear expectations and i'll come back to that good communication and input collaboration and making sure you have the right environment and resources to carry out your research so that's my sort of the position I'm coming from, I suppose, and we've again, we've discussed this, but I'm sure we all know this, but universities are trying to push disciplinary boundaries and solve complex problems in research, but also trying to teach a diverse range of subjects with a lot of different students and many of us have moved to a year round model of teaching. I was fascinated UCL have got 10%, you only get 10% research time if you're a teaching lecturer, we only get 10% research time if we're a TNR lecturer. I mean, we have some faculties over COVID who said that, literally changed their mo working workload model because they couldn't cope with the workload and the numbers to do it. And we're trying to, re we're trying to recover that back, but um, you know, those pressures were, were real at the time. So it's, yeah, it's interesting. Um, and obviously they're trying to do this while they're fairness, uh, demonstrating fairness and transparency, good ethics and integrity, and certainly our, and I'm sure many other institutions want to be anchor institutions in the local community, which goes back to the point about engagement stuff, I think. But if you're an individual academic, as we've um, touched on, you want grants and papers, you're trying to write impact case studies, do outreach, make your teaching innovative, make sure you're meeting all the EDI considerations, being a leader, mentoring people, pastoral care of students is massive at the moment. We have lots of practice based academics as well, like media studies kind of people. I mean, not we the institution, not we in maths, uh, as we've mentioned before, links with industry policy, et cetera. So there's lots of. Um, a, a much more broader range of things that you need to do, and we have to be adaptive as of like this week, as far as I can tell, we all have to worry about chat GPT. That wasn't a thing a fortnight ago. I don't know what's happened, but um, and things more. Uh, longer term things like decolonizing the curriculum so you have to adapt to all these new uh pressures and so one of the things that uh you can't read at the bottom of my slide is that we're trying to we're certainly trying to develop a team approaches to re research and teaching and recognizing those team things so my belief is that we have this we need a significant culture change and i think this is not just my belief this is a there's a lot of external pressure for this and we can see that the institutions we've talked about today are already moving towards this but as we've said, not all institutions are there. So the traditional systems only you know, are very focused on that big grant and those four star papers, whatever that means. But if we want all those other things that we do as institutions require, we have to recognise and reward that wider de definition of an academic. Recognise team working, which is certainly our senior management are struggling to understand how you do that. Doesn't seem that hard to me, but you know how you value that and um, recognising good leadership and mentoring and championing of people and not just going, oh, well, that's what the, that's what the women do, um, or some men, obviously. Um, I was trying to think about this from a, from a maths point of view. I mean, we, the, the, obviously it's very broad. I 
one of the reasons I put the first slide up is I'm an applied mathematician. And so from my point of view, I'm either leading and developing new theory with reference to some case studies and therefore writing a more mathsy paper or supporting application areas. And, and certainly traditionally people have found that difficult to understand. Oh, oh you're not a leader then? And you go, well, I can be a leader, but also I can be a supporter of other people's research and, and do a, a bit of modelling that gives a really interesting perspe perspective on their work. The advantage is it's very clear what my role is in these things. So there are some really interesting ways, I think, and we all know that there's lots of contribution in terms of research, uh, still pushing disciplinary boundaries, et cetera. But these complex problems that we have to solve as a world um, require all this. You know all this. But the narrative CV um, or the Royal Society's resume for researchers, which is R4RI, that can't be right. Resume for researchers, I don't know what the I stands for, um, is something that, well, the Royal Society have brought up, but the UKRI are really taking seriously now. So increasingly wanting to use for um, funding applications, but then um, the hope is that it would support, that we'd be using it in institutions as well. So I'd be interested to see if people are. My understanding is that nobody's using it very seriously in institutions for promotion or appointments yet but I think we're moving that way and the idea is that it's to help so this is from the uh, UKRI uh, website there's an alternative users users group I'll tell you about in a minute um, but it's about attracting and retaining talent um, but allowing people to demonstrate who they are as individuals and how they contribute to teams um, so it's meant to be about improving who and what is visible and valued beyond the traditional metrics which are easy to measure so that's the dream um there is a template that's meant to help you evidence the sort of skills and experience um and the the uk or our current one has these four modules so one about generation of new ideas tools methodologies so that's a more traditional kind of research focused element i guess um but then these other things that fit with what we were talking about earlier about um, engagement. So development of others um, and mentoring, contributions to wider research and innovation community, and then um, contributions towards wider societal benefit. So it allows you to describe a broader range of things, but also contributions to a, to a team. That's the idea. So it's a nice idea. Um, the issues potentially are that if you're trying to write your narrative CV, the people who are already good at selling themselves will continue to be able to sell themselves. And the ones who can't sell themselves so well might still not make the most of what they do. So we need to support people in writing these. We need people to be trained in reading them so that they don't bring the old perspectives uh, and that they look at, they understand what it is that we're trying to achieve here. So there's um, some training to do for the readers, and that's a big piece of work, I think, both both sides of that. <clears throat> As I say, UKRI using it a bit um, increasingly. They're keen that institutions use it for recruitment, promotion, um, awards, appointments, committees, any way where you use a CV to assess people, you might want to use this. Um, and then they're trying to support this because it's a new thing. So this alternative uses group is a Universities UK and UKRI jointly thinged group. Um, they are going to provide a lot of resources or we're currently developing those resources. So I'm part of this group. So we need to persuade institutions to use it and we need to train people to use it effectively. They're also trying to assess how well it works. So they're trying to provide the evidence to show that this works so that we've developed a, an assessment criteria so that anyone who's using it in pilot studies and things can report the results in, in the same way so that you've got a large data set across lots of institutions. And Cambridge, I hope I'm not saying the wrong one there, have got some uh, Research England money to do 
what I'm going to call physical experiments. So really get people to do a normal CV and a narrative CV, different groups to assess them and see how it works. So they're trying to get the evidence to show this is useful and it is, does do what we want it to do. And they are running sessions. There's one in March to tell people more about it, that alternative uses group. So that I presume the slides will be shared for this and people can get those links if they if they want to. So I'm hopeful that this is a big change that might come and, and help us to value and acknowledge a broader range of skills than is currently um, covered. So it, we will hopefully be able to use that to demonstrate different promotion criteria. Um, quite interesting, as we were saying, Helen was saying earlier, I think these are the a little bit of the criteria from Sterling. And what they say is so uh, same process as Helen was saying, people put themselves forward. We hopefully use our. Um, what we call achieving success, um, but re annual review to identify the people that the purpose of that should be to identify people who we want to promote in now or in two years time and talk to them about what they need to do to achieve that um then it gets approved at faculty level and then it goes to the institutional committee um but what they say is that they don't apply the criteria rigidly nor does it proceed formulaically and that's meant to be a strong selling point which i think it could be um and as others have said it's got headings of research um teaching academic leadership and professional practice. So those are the headings under which you need to write things. And as we said, there's different criteria, different level for each um, stage. For me, the issue with this is that it is open for people to act positively and to reward a wider range of things, but it's also open for people to act negatively. And as I think we established, um, fortunately, it seems my gut instinct, Helen, is Helen isn't an arse. But if Helen was an arse, then she has an awful amount of power to, um, to behave badly. And we definitely got examples across the institution. And I'm sure every this is not, I'm not for one minute saying Sterling's worse than anywhere else. But you, lots of stories of unconscious bias coming into play and people not acting fairly. Um, so I'd like us to see, see us do something more prescriptive um to try and help with that sort of so we have we have the potential for good practice but i think you just have to be constantly aware now i've spoke to a lovely person from hr this morning who's saying they're trying to get their unconscious bias training more better i understand that sentence didn't work very well um but they're trying to get more rigorous and um serious unconscious bias training in i still think the people who need unconscious bias training don't take unconscious bias training seriously. But anyway, we definitely got senior managers who say, I have not got unconscious bias. And that anyway. It, worse than that, we've got a head of HR who says none of our senior staff are biased. <laughs> We're all biased. I thought we'd agreed. I thought we'd all agreed that. Um, Glasgow have got some really nice rules that they brought in fairly recently. Actually, the wording is not as strong as I thought it was when I first heard about this, but for the professoriate specifically, they are um, they are explicit about collegial. Sorry, let me try that sentence again about collegiality towards peers. So um, and that's in research and teaching and other stuff. So I've cut down the bits here, concentrate on the words that are underlined, really. But um, because you know a lot of it is about mentoring colleagues and collegiality is a threshold criterion and maybe a deciding factor in a promotion case so that's not as positive as i thought it was when i first heard about it because the issue here is how to measure and my fear is for many of these criteria if you say in order to be a professor you need to demonstrate that you mentor people a lot of people go yeah i mentor people that person who's my postdoc i've mentored them you haven't what you've done is supervise them and so mentoring well should be a criteria in there so i'd be really keen to see 360 feedback also the sort of environment where people are open to actually they feel free to actually give proper 360 feedback um also which is a risk again so so it's potential for um sorry i've gone 
potential for gaming, but I sort of think it's really possible. So for me, hang on, I've broken everything. There we go. Being explicit about that, and we talked about the Athena Swan bit in Lancaster, uh, Lancaster's criteria. That's that's hugely important that people that there's this communication of this is what we expect of you. Um, so I think that's really nice. Dundee are much more specific. So they only brought this in a year ago. They say it's not perfect. And it does fit with some of the things people have said that other institutions are doing. Um, but basically, you have to, oh, sorry, what am I doing there? You have to have research and scholarship. And you, well, if you're on the right contract, you have to have education. And then you choose between service and leadership and engagement, impact and enterprise. So you don't have to hit all the four. Uh, things so as Alex was saying the idea is not that now oh god now we have to be good at everything they've got a list of very specific criteria some of them are a bit wishy-washy but some of them for example level d is be the first supervisor for a phd student or an ra um, as one of the successful contributions in research so there's a, a list of these quite specific criteria and um can't remember who it was but you know so so you've got a b c d um i suppose this is the mathematician in me it it delights me entirely that you get to this list of you need to be a c c and a d it's like an entry requirement or something what i think is particularly valuable about this so promotion to chair you need to be the top level in one of those categories but it does not have to be in research or education so you do not have to have hit some big research criteria. You could be doing some phenomenal piece of um, engagement with industry or something different that comes under one of those headings. So that really, for me, that that, that specific sentence changes the balance, makes it much more balanced. Certainly, again, although our criteria, we do have a teaching promotion path, it's much, much more difficult to, to move along because it requires some a lot of external stuff and potentially publishing about teaching. And so, so I think certainly the feeling from people is that research is what's valued in promotion criteria, but teaching is what um, we need people to do really well. So, so this for me is a step towards that sort of balanced book where you don't have to be you know, big grant tick and then everything else behind. We're, as I say, they're saying it's, they know it's not perfect, but I liked it as a thing. We are currently looking at our promotion criteria at Sterling, so I'm very keen for us to be um, using some of these ideas and, again, particularly focusing on that team, research team thing. So just to finish, I suppose my dream, hope, I think we all know this, but we need a much more diverse range of skills and practices than academia used to. Um, we can't all rely on um, having someone at home to do all cooking, cleaning, washing, ironing for us. Sometimes we have to worry our pretty little head about some of those things as well. Um, institutionally, I think we need to communicate those requirements and expectations and recognise value and reward them. So like Lancaster's you know, contribution to Athena Swan, I think that's brilliant. Wait, this this is what we value. This is what we'd like you to do. Please do it. Is is massive. Um, but for all of these things, all this kind of good leadership, good practice takes a huge amount of time, and we need to allow people the time to do it. And again, I think that's where a lot of the issues can come in. We often end up with a not we again. I'm sure this is universal. But, oh, we we wanted to do the. UKRI do it all the time. We'd have liked to give you a longer time to submit your grant, but um, we have to spend the money by a certain date and therefore we can't be good in terms of EDI practices because we've been pushed, we've been pressured. And so that those things seem to be the things that slip when uh, when pressure comes on like COVID or short time scales. So um, we need to get better at allowing time to understand what people are doing, whether they do they should be put forward for promotion and uh, acknowledge that if they're being a good leader, it's taking them a, a long time to do it. OK, that was all my slides. Thank you very much. I will stop sharing. Thank you. Thanks, Camilla. Thank you. That's, that's really rather um, a different angle. 
Um, are we questions? Uh, Alex. Hi, Rachel. Thanks a lot Hello. for that. Um, yeah, it, it ties into something that I've been thinking a lot recently. So there seems to be a school of thought among some good practice people, I suspect mainly in HR, that a way to put in good practice and more fairness is you have these rigid criteria and, and, you're, and you're then ranking people against each other and that this is going to be fair. And it seems to me that what, what that catches is, is explicit bias because someone can't come along and go, that person's gay, I'm not promoting them because you've got to look at their scores. But it, it does nothing for the more structural bias, right? That women get fewer citations, that people who are not white get lower grant income. And so I feel like this narrative approach is a much better approach. But how have you, how have you had those conversations with people who think we should have this much more rigorous fixed criteria that we're ranking people against? Yeah, I'm really torn because I like the fixed criteria in that I think, again, it goes back to what we were discussing earlier. Maybe you need more examples of what counts as uh, what Maddie was saying counts as good practice or counts as something in that category because you could miss something important. But at least it's clear and transparent and people know what they need to achieve and how they could do it rather than relying on someone going, you've done a good job there or not because you smell. Um, so, so I would like to see us push towards something that's a little bit more structured, but the, as you say, the narrative approach allows that it's structured, but has many, many more things that it values. I think perhaps that's where I'm going. So that actually being co-I on a grant is just as valuable as being PI on a grant. And uh, you don't have to be first author on the paper. And lots of this is very subject specific, but um, we just don't seem to be able to distinguish those uh, seemingly obvious um, differences, you know, particularly if you're a, yeah, if it's your bits, the model in the paper and you third author, then that's fine because your bit's the model in the paper. Not here's 48,000 people on a paper and what can they all possibly have done? I think, again, there's a, but, but the point of the narrative CV is you can say this is the role I took or for the, for particularly for early career researchers who can't be PI on grants but are named researchers because it was their idea and they did all the work, they can say that much more explicitly and the person who's the PI might go, yeah, I just support them you would hope but um it gives a chance so yeah so i think this i th really hope the narrative cv is the way forward to capture a lot more of this stuff but it's complicated and it's not completely obvious it will work immediately and the game in the game in the system is going to happen all the time but if it helps people and still the same people who gamed before would game now maybe it's okay maybe it's not I'm smashing the patriarchy by Christmas. That's what I said last year. I was wrong. This next Christmas, I'm smashing the patriarchy by Christmas, if that's. Uh, I'm not sure we can match that. Any further <laughs> questions, comments? Just leave it there. Any more questions for Rachel? Yes, Camilla. Hey, Rachel. It's um, great to see this sort of an approach. I think I, I, I like it as well. Um, although I, I prefer the, I think I prefer, quite like the grey um, criteria because I think um, Helen said that you, you just then need to use them to you know to fit your narrative to what the criteria says and really I suspect people that write criteria don't really know what they mean either exactly um and people that apply criteria hopefully don't exactly know but maybe they do um but my question was something to um to you and I think to Helen as well because you both mentioned having committee uh, promotion committees um and I can I think in principle it's a great idea, but I can imagine that's that can be quite difficult in practice sometimes because different people might have a, 
diff very different opinions, um, certainly, and no, no, from various committees. It, we sometimes work with people that are very, um, very opinionated <laughs> on these things. Um, so I was wondering if you have any sort of advice on how to make that effective and efficient. Um, and is this, you know, does it come from choosing the right people? Or maybe there isn't that much choice or... I don't, Rich, I don't really know how much involvement you have in those committees because you're a bit higher up, but um, maybe you have. I'm, I'm both higher up and lower down. Um, <laughs> so I think Helen's probably got a better answer. But my, from our point of view, it's very, from the faculty level, it's the dean and all the heads of departments. And the theory should be that the heads of department are basically taking your, so they're making your case for you if, largely so it's probably not up to I mean if there's some debate I guess everyone else joins in but they're almost at that point supporting you and making the case hopefully or going no it's not quite good enough you, you need to work on this bit and then hopefully giving you feedback so I don't think people are working against one another there particularly um so I think that's not to, but but there are certainly faculties where I've heard of heads of departments going, oh, I can't read your application because I'm meant to be neutral. I'm on the panel. It's like, no, you're not. You're meant to be representing the person who you've just. So even within our university, different people do different Sorry, things. But I would hope it's not. I, I know what you mean, but people tend to be diff it's because it's not competitive, because it's not we can only put three forward. Then I think it's a completely different story. If you're doing every, judging everyone on merit, which you should be in theory. No one can tell me that's not true. Um, then it should be okay. Um, I think there's, you know, well, there's a potential for people seeing merit as a different thing. Yes, and I would agree with that. So we have it, essentially the faculty level thing. There's nobody advocating. It's a here is all of the evidence, including the head statements. We're just going to judge them and, and ensure that things are balanced across the institution. Um, the departmental promotions committee is much more where people put their input in about things like the relative importance of, you know, what do you do with somebody who's brought in an enormous research grant, but who does not quite tick the compulsory box of all teaching must be at high quality standard. And there are different views on what you do with that and how you feed it back to the individual concerned. Um, I would say the promotions committee is the most difficult committee that I regularly chair precisely because of that it's the only meeting I've been in where another committee meeting has been quietly whatsapping me supportive messages about how somebody else is treating me during the meeting but in the end with allowing sufficient discussion and then I've gone for always erring on the side of generosity towards the colleague going for promotion the worst that happens is you put forward someone who the college then decides is not quite ready and they have to deal with the disappointment. It's not a huge loss. So that's the way that I've always run it. But yeah, you're right. It is It is very difficult because you'll also hit people who you then realise have been have not been guided sufficiently on the criteria and maybe have been told, oh, you just need one more paper when actually what they really needed was to put in a grant application, for instance. And when it gets to promotion committee, it's kind of, well, if they've been told that, it's not really on, is it? <laughs> you, you kind of pick up the things that have gone wrong in the past at that point, which is also awkward. Yeah, it is genuinely tough, no question. You haven't got a magic solution to this one either, have you? <laughs> I don't think I've got any magic solutions. <laughs> Further questions to Rachel? Perhaps we can thank Rachel for a very interesting presentation on the narrative, which I hadn't thought about, I must say. Um, and then we move on to a general discussion. I sh yeah. So thank you, Rachel. Um, We've got time now for general discussion on the, well, first on the theme of good practice in promotions, 
but also we can discuss um, future workshops in more detail. But perhaps we should start with um, any, any more insight or um, questions about promotions from anyone related to the talks or not. And we start with Sarah. Thank you, Anne. So I want, well, I'd like to go back to the narrative CV because as, uh, as uh, Rachel mentioned, I also see potentially uh, um, a great merit uh, uh, by, you know, focusing on different aspects and not research excellence, whatever that means uh, uh, alone. But as Rachel alluded to, there are risks, uh, and particularly whenever I have the opportunity to discuss with the community, you know, mathematicians are not necessarily very good at, uh, you know, presenting a case or making a narrative. Uh, so, so you know, I think it is it is an interesting uh, development, um, but it will take, um, you know, some time before. Um, the community will will fine tune it uh, in a way that it works. So I'm I'm just curious to see what are other reactions. Uh, as you mentioned, Rachel, UK RI seems to be very keen on it. I've seen it already in many of the fellowships uh, um, applications. So it's obviously something um, which will be with us for uh, for at least a, a medium uh, term. So so I wonder, you know, what. I'm glad to see that there will be examples. I think one one of the community asks where can we have examples of of these um, narrative CVs, etc. So I'm 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 just curious what what other things of um, of that um, as a positive or negative or you know any reactions really. Can I just add briefly that they are now starting to think about disciplinary differences and wanting to talk to learned societies or whatever the appropriate groups are and maybe this is one of the appropriate groups about what would be specific good practice for for, for mathematical sciences for example um and is you know what are the, is there anything different about us or, or what we would put in the training materials ultimately are there specific training materials you need for for certain subject areas that, that are above the generic ones so that's something that needs a bit of thought but I don't know the answer to that yet. Is anyone using them in their institutions or come up, or they had to use them? Anyone written one yet? Not yet. <laughs> it's on my list just to do out of curiosity. But it's quite low down my list. Well, at Lancaster, we, we need to write an expanded CV, uh, but it's limited to 10 pages max. So you need to say what is your contribution in each, and you're allowed to have some kind of small narrative. But um, I don't think it's the same as you were explaining. It's still very small, and we are limited by the page numbers. I've seen it adopted uh, much more by European institutions. So I, I had to be, I was involved in in some, in fact, promotions in the Netherlands, uh, and there and there was, um, it was much more standard than than it is here. So in a sense, I think this is um, seems to be happening in other in other countries. Uh, so that that will be interesting to see. I mean, are there any other examples of good practice in our universities or bad practice, in fact, with promotions? We've heard what, you know, we've heard three diff very different um, presentations on um, promotions, mainly good practice. Oh, Demetrius. Hello everyone, yeah, and happy to talk about, and uh, happy new year. To, oh, sorry, I'm having an issue with my sound. I'll come. I'll get back soon.
You're mute. I think he's having. Can you hear me now? Yes. Terribly sorry. Yes. Uh, Happy New Year to everyone. It, it, it's been fantastic. Yeah, all the presentations and the information. I just have a quest, question. Or, yeah, it's not a remark, it's a question. I'm sensing what is really va uh, like needed urgent, urgently. One of the crucial points when it comes to action plan is the coordination national wide across the institutions. Feel free to correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. You're definitely more expert than me. And I'm wondering what is going on on this front when it comes to coordination national wide across institutions, some yeah, common framework, sort of agreement, because I'm sensing no matter how hard we push, and it's fantastic but what you're doing, and you're all established academics, and the fact that you do care and you do all of that is, is, is amazingly encouraging. But at the same time, I'm wondering, we need something coordinated, right? Like, like nationwide for, 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 for not bigger impact, but for, yeah, for, for making it more efficient, not just effective. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering about, yeah, about that. I'm not sure about that. I think we might want our different institutions to be allowed to have their different flavors. I think we have different needs and different priorities and we will promote accordingly. So, so may I have a follow up on this one? So I, I think it's great. Uh, and yeah, but at the same time, we need a common base as a reference point, right? I mean, which can definitely be finely tuned with respect to institutions, departments, schools, needs, and university, uh, different university of, university of, universities, of course. But at the same time, I'm sensing it is something which might play a vital, a crucial role in that, uh, uh, the minimum, minimal amount, uh, uh, level of coordination as a common point of reference, as a reference framework. I don't know, I'm wondering. So I, I sort of agree. So my big worry is I spend all my time going, we need to be collegiate, we need to be supportive, we need to work in teams, we need to do lovely stuff. You should do Athena Swan because at Lancaster you get recognised for doing Athena Swan. And then you completely scupper someone who wants to go to somewhere else because they don't recognise those things. Now, I also think probably you therefore don't want to go to that institution <laughs> because they don't recognise that kind of thing. But that's not the point, right? So I do have a worry that I, I'm building a dream world in Sterling that may then not serve people when other institutions have not caught up to that. I th think, I hope everyone will be having to move in this direction and it, and we will all get there eventually but i think there's a real risk that you that that actually we should be going yeah sorry i was really going to swear badly then sod everyone else do what you want get your grant write your papers don't do any of that collegiate stuff because no one really cares about that they only care about grants which is the safest piece of advice to give someone <laughs> but nonetheless not what i want to be encouraging and supporting so I have a because if COVID hits again or something like that, and all those pressures come on to people, then suddenly all the good intentions fly out the window because there's no money. And how do you choose who's best? What's well, the one with the big grant? So I have a real, but I genuinely, I want to believe that that everyone's going to have to move in this direction because the role of academic has changed so significantly. That's what I think. Damien. Hello. Well, I was just going to say that in my current institution, this is the first promotion round I'm going to be witnessing, which is part of the reason I was curious to, to come along and listen to, to what people presented. I have been through many promotion rounds where I was before, um, and that was an institution that was changing rapidly and therefore for a particular category of staff, uh, progression requirements changed, not necessarily in difficulty, but you know, it was an institution that started with uh, quite a balanced approach to, to, to progression and then specialized much more into research and teaching. And so people who, who suddenly found themselves on the teaching side with a good research profile weren't being, being recognized. So, so just warning about these changing requirements for progression can lead people in a bit of a, a spot that they weren't, they were preparing for one set of criteria and then a the criteria changed. Um, but I think the point that's been raised 
that I think is really interesting and difficult is that there's progression internally, but there's also, as just been mentioned, progression through change of institution. Uh, and one of the things that I'm mindful of, and it's not always easy, is to ensure that we're applying the same criteria to people coming in, uh, not easier, uh, but certainly not more, more difficult, um, partly because I think staff sometimes perceive that it's easier to be recruited to a higher level uh, than it is to be promoted. And I think certainly promotion, we have to be careful that promotion isn't more difficult than being recruited onto the same position. Thank you. That's very interesting. Are there, Alex. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'm going to be one of those negative people that was mentioned at the start of Nadia's talk and talk about some bad practice. And this is where my question to Rachel came from. So we have these academic metrics. So anything that can be measured is measured about us. And it's put on a nice A4 piece of paper. And we are ranked within our department and put into deciles and then color coded with traffic lights from which decile you're in. And so this was going on the front of any promotion packs when it went to the faculty panel. So, so when this was introduced, I politely went very ballistic at a staff meeting with, with the head of faculty um, and pointed out that there are very severe bias issues with this. And that they've stopped the color coding at least, but that ranked those deciles are still there on the front of everyone's promotion materials. Um, don't do that, please. <laughs> and tell Sheffield not to do it anymore. It's a great example of bad practice. Is one of the metrics though, are you an ass? Because if it was, that would be all right, right? You know, we need to be measured, the right metrics need to be in there. And that's the other thing we don't do. <laughs> I mean, are there any further comments or questions on promotions? Um, before we, well, I'd like to thank all of our speakers for their amazing contributions. But before we close, um, the London Mathematical Society Good Practice Scheme organizes workshops a couple of times a year and we very much value your suggestions on what we should do because you are our community. And without your suggestions, you're just left with what we can think about doing when, we, when, the, when the steering uh, group meets. And that's not always what the community wants. We do have one more workshop lined up and Sarah will mention that. But if there are other suggestions, please either say now or send me an email or send if you don't know if you can't find my email address send Catherine at LMS an email about your suggestions and they will be forwarded to us I mean we'd really like to hear your opinions of whether we're doing things right whether you want more or less what you would like I think they've all got your email because they all got onto Zoom. Oh yeah, that's true. <laughs> um. And maybe while people attendees think about it, the you know potential suggestions. Yeah. So let let me tell you um, a bit uh, what the next one uh, uh, we Anne and I are, are are planning and the LMS uh, with Catherine's help. Uh, so so. One thing that seems to be important uh, was uh, to look, we have been looking at the so-called pipeline again and again uh, at, at regular intervals. And uh, the two really difficult points uh, are mid-career. And so promotion, in a sense, was addressing precisely that um, leak in the pipeline or stagnation, uh, uh, you know, that, that we know um, affect adversely you know, women, but not only women, diversity more generally. And so the, the promotion, the, this kind of conversation that, that we have started today, and I'm I'm really, really, you know, grateful uh, to, to Nadia, Helen uh, and Rachel, because I think we, we had uh, such a 
fantastic and diverse uh, perspectives, which, which you know uh, definitely have been uh, to me very very helpful, and I hope uh, others felt uh, you know equally inspired and and challenged uh, uh, as well. So progression, therefore, was addressing the first leak, uh, or, or or the if you like the more advanced leak. But then there is a very another one, very seriously affecting affecting the community, namely. The first leak in the pipeline is is um, how do we attract uh, a diverse uh, um, community of students into um, postgraduate, uh, PGR in particular, so PhD level. And that will be the focus of what our next good practice scheme workshop. So that will be in March and we are finalizing the dates. And the plan in that, in that um, will be to invite uh, a few groups of students, so Piscopia, the Piscopia Initiative, uh, it is um, a group of um, uh, postgraduate students started in Scotland, but then, um, you know, percolated down or up, <laughs> depending to, to the country. And now I know that in many departments, there are Piscopia teams. Huh? So these are these are postgraduate students self-organized. They, they particularly want to attract more women and non-binary um, students into into um, PhD level studies, and then there is another team um, shared, well, organized between between Oxford, London, and Bath, who have been organizing also event to address and attract a much more diverse uh, um, cohort of students into into postgraduate studies. So what we want to do in March will be to invite them, and this time it will be an hybrid event, so personally, in person at the LMS in London, but also online for those who cannot travel. But it will be, you know, us, the participants, the academics, in a sense, together with the students, and, and join forces in understanding where are the barriers, uh, what are the intervention needed. Uh, and this, this second workshop comes from, from realizing that uh, we as a community have been trying to raise the numbers, increase the diversity of our PhD cohorts, uh, and those having CDTs know how difficult that, that can, or challenging can be at times, uh, and seeing that the bar has really shifted very, very little. So. You know, the, the hope is that bringing in the students uh, and the younger generations, maybe we can learn uh, something together or, or at least discuss this uh, uh, with, with them as well. So that, that will be the, the upcoming um, next workshop. Uh, and then, uh, as, as Anne pointed out, uh, do, do let us know what, what else, uh, you know, would be interesting in discussing. Um, and and um, so your ideas would, would be very welcomed. Thank you. Thank you for that. Are there any further discussion, points, ideas for workshops, please? Volunteers to organize workshops? <laughs> no. Okay, well, look, thank you all so much for coming and all your contributions. And for our speakers, our committee, thank you very, and in particular, Catherine, who's been here the whole time, uh, looking after Zoom, took over when mine froze, I believe. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Anne.